Welcome guys. I'm just going to do a quick video on my last steps that I usually take before uh, Substance Painter and then jumping over into Substance Painter with um, this particular weapon. If you've already completed these steps, you should be good to go, but oftentimes um, once we get to Substance, we might start to notice texture stretching uh, is a common one that I've seen. Um, just because when we did the test weapon a few weeks ago using the extrude method, um, some people have held on to that uh, where we use multi cut, and you don't want to use that method for this particular project. Um, you technically still get away with that, but you need to move away from using your concept dart image as your. Um, texture for your object. So one thing you could start by doing is just assigning a blank texture to it. Uh, assign existing material, Lambert 1, or if Lambert 1 is um, currently your texture, you could go to assign new material and choose either a Blin or a Lambert. Uh, Blin is actually good to use in this case because it is shiny, as is the Fong. Uh, Blin has more in common with um, game shaders, though, so usually, um, in my experience, I've used Blin more often. So you, here you can see that it's got a little bit of shine to it now. Uh, another thing to consider is pulling your sword out of low poly mode, where you can see all these divisions, right? Now, in the viewport, it's good to be able to view this wireframe, but um, it's but when you're looking at it in substance, right, you, you actually want to hide all of that geometry underneath. You don't want people to concentrate on the geometry. You want them to be thinking of the design, right? Um, so parts of this you can already see, like here, where you might get dark splotches. Um, you might get areas that are blackened or have been like flipped onto each other. Sometimes it might look like a little bit of uh, spotting going on, or when you select certain polygons that they're misbehaving or acting strangely. Often, if I'm going across my model and I can select a face in that area, I'm going to try to just grab it and move it and see what the connections are, like where I made that. You know, it was probably at an earlier stage when I was. Um, thinking in a different direction. So if you notice areas like this, oftentimes it's best to just delete them outright, where fixing them might be more trouble than they're worth. So often I'll just make a hole, and then I will use bridge to fill that hole. Now in this case, um, we've also looked at fill hole under the mesh menu as a potential solution. If it's a simple hole that you can see all the edges from and you double click the edge, right? in this case, it will select that entire ring and I could just do mesh fill hole. That would be the least number of clicks. Right? But if it was a little bit more complex shape that was missing now, say like I had cut some pieces out and now I had like this weird shaped gap in my, in my model, um, in that case, it's better to go to edge mode and using, uh, I'm just in full screen perspective mode here. And you'll have to use your imagination or your, your problem solving abilities a little bit more here, right? And what we're gonna do is use the bridge tool instead to, to fill those uh, this whole area. So just to show you what happens if I do a fill hole with a twist in it, right? It actually did a pretty good job here. Um, so that might be an option. You often will see that any new faces that you create might be a different color, right? Or especially if they are uh, bright neon green, means that they're missing a texture. So you just need to, again, assign existing material. I'm holding right click here. Um, and then the other potential problem that I see is a flipped face. This is because 
each polygon, right, only has a normal in one direction, which means that from the inside, it's not reflecting any light. Um, so for flipped faces, they will usually appear black, at least in Maya. And the operation here is mesh display reverse. Right, so if you have any areas of your model where you can select pieces, um, I know there was even one this weekend where somebody had like a large section of their model uh, that was appearing black inside the viewport. Right, it looked kind of like this. And all the geometry was there and it was it was made perfectly fine, but oftentimes this happens when you are extruding uh, for some reason, Maya interprets um, the the side of the face incorrectly when it is extruding. So again, mesh display reverse to fix any dark areas. Um, and you can use fill hole. Just if it's a complex shape like this, I would still want to go into multi-cut and choose the different cuts uh, that match the rest of the model. That way I'm deciding where the curvature of the object is. I'm not just leaving it up to random chance because Maya will just kind of like roll the dice and pick um, which faces to make uh, a triangle on each face. Right? When the when the renderer looks at it, it still looks at triangles. And here you can see, you know, this face here, for example, if you slice that uh, flat face in half, it is often going to change how that looks slightly in the renderer itself. Um, so just being careful to um, make sure that you have plenty of support in your model, as in all vertices are connected to uh, four edges, ideally. All right, so if I have one vertex, each vertex four edges. If I have areas that get more complex, um, where I've made triangles, sometimes I'll have a pole, we call it. So this vertex here is connected to one, two, three, four, five edges, which means that um, any changes that are made to that particular vertex affect a lot of different areas at the same time. And this can cause some nightmares on your UV unwrap because then this one point, if you think of it like a spider web, right, or something where it's being pulled in all these directions, as soon as you shift it, it's now putting stretching into all those other areas at the same time, right? Whereas with uh, a normal quad, it's a little bit easier to control when we're thinking of square pixels and squares on the model. Um, this is typically why I try to avoid triangles and I especially avoid uh, n-gons where um, a, a face might only ha or might have more than uh, four sides to it. But even long stretched out polygons like this are a little bit risky. Again, none of this stuff is necessarily going to break your model, um, but it can cause problems down the line, including texture problems or even um, display problems inside the, the game engine. So this is why I want you to take these models onto Sketchfab as well, just because uh, any problems that have maybe not been visible to us become apparent then. So in this area that I filled, now you can see on the UV unwrap that it's actually got something funky going on here. This is because in UV terms, each edge that we can select here actually has two edges because it has an edge that it is connected to. Right, This edge here in red is connected to the opposite one here, but on the model, right, those edges are, are sealed and and tucked away. So as I mouse over these seams in uh, UV mode, there I can see 
the corresponding edge. And in this case, when I've created new faces, it is now sealed those edges back um, in the UVs that were sealed in um, in 3D space. Um, let me just fix this. So this was the flip face. Let me fix that really quick. Flip face does not uh, have any any effect over there, unless there's only one. Then it would mean uh, it would become a seam or to have a seam around that object. So here again in 3D space, if I have my UV window open, I can see this white seam of edges around the spot that I've chosen to cut my model at. So I can always choose to select edges in 3D space. Sometimes it's a bit easier to spot the problem areas like this edge as well. And then inside of our cut and sew menu, we can either sew patches together or we can cut seams apart. And once I've cut that piece off, now it is going to correctly assume that it wants to go here. I can also select that last UV that is left, if I can get my hands on it. Um, looks like there's still a cut missing. where these guys have attached themselves. Um, but what I would do is then look at this UV shell at the bottom. Oh, okay, there's a cut right here that I would need to sew together. Now, for the UV shells themselves, um, if you do a good job of splitting up the object using these white lines, these seams, right, and using the cut tool, the shift X, um, then you want to be using the unfold and optimize buttons here inside of the unfold drop down. Sorry about that. Um, what the unfold is going to do is it's going to try and lay flat those areas, right? So in this case, um, it's created this shape because I've also cut it on the X and Y or on the grid level. I hide my concept art. Right, I also have a seam running down the sides here. Now, for any project like this where I have a symmetrical weapon that I'm dealing with, or a symmetrical object, um, I find that it's actually a nice shortcut. Oh, here, I have to fix the shell as well. Um, it's actually a good thing to only concentrate on one side of the object, right? either the top or the bottom when UV unwrapping, and to have the seam going all the way around. If you've crafted your weapon um, all the way uh, so that there's an edge that goes all the way around it. You can just double click on that edge and choose cut over here right, to, to split that. Um, but I go a step further in that I sometimes worry that maybe the underside geometry isn't matching or sometimes I'll spot things that aren't matching. And I'd like to actually just use the mirror function to ensure that my objects are perfectly symmetrical. So I go into the front view or wherever I can see the weapon uh, most easily um, as far as seeing all of the, um, the edges here in the center. And I select just half of it, the, one, the half that I trust the least maybe to be correct. Then in object mode, 
I will use the mirror function over here and change the axis and the merge threshold in order to get uh, that symmetry back. However, the real benefit is that now the UV shells are stacked perfectly on top of one another. And I only have to texture one side in Substance Painter and the other side will, um, will also work. Now, I have noticed a bit of a bug in Substance around this um, regarding like darker areas on the, on the model. Um, so I might need to investigate that further. Um, if I was noticing those kinds of problems and I wasn't able to fix them though, I would probably just sacrifice some space on my mesh. Now, what we can do just to show this is if I make a duplicate of my weapon with control D, right? And this is my UV unwrap. If I were to, on this weapon, then unstack my um, my shells. So one thing that you can do instead of manually create or moving your shells around, or to get a first uh, go at it, is under modify to use the layout command. So it, this is within the UV editor, not within the main Maya. Uh, menus, right? So I have to have the UV editor open and then modify. Click the little box next to layout. Here we want to use the same resolution that we're using for our texture. So 1024 is a good base. I could bump this up if I had a lot of different parts potentially. Uh, the other important setting to change is the shell padding and the tile padding. And when I press apply, it's going to try and lay out those shells. But I just realized that I have uh, left stacked similar on. The other settings I can change are if I want it to be able to rotate the shells as well as move them around. So maybe if I already have like a configuration that I like, uh, I might not want to rotate them, like for instance, if I have a face or a part of the object that I want to think about as a texture and be able to easily look at, I would line that uh, up and down. I wouldn't let it rotate. So now if I do a layout, I get another, U or I get all of those parts split up, right? And it's found uh, room for all of those different pieces and distributed them as best it can while keeping all parts um, relatively the same size to each other. But if we look at these two objects, right, we can kind of see if they're next to each other, that the pixel density on the one on the right, or oh, I have to have the UV editor open, sorry. The pixel density is actually slightly greater than the one on the left because this has larger cubes that means that the pixels themselves will be larger versus this unwrap with the uh, symmetry option, right? The object is actually going to be able to hold more pixels along um, its surface than, than this object. So it'll be slightly lower texture resolution. That can sometimes also have an impact on your substance textures. So I'm going to go ahead and get this one ready for export. I'll move this, this guy over to the side. Whenever I'm about to do something like an export, I want to do an increment and save. Next steps for exporting your object would be to center it on the grid, potentially also changing the orientation. This is going to depend on your game or how you want it to come into your game, right? Oops. If, well, let's look at the first things first. First thing is we want to get rid of our object history. So we go edit, delete all by type history. 
We could also think about giving our object a name, because right now it's just called p cube one. We go to modify center pivot to start with. Then again, if your game has different uh, orientation or pivot needs, in this case a sword, usually I'm going to have the pivot in the center of the handle. That way I can easily attach it inside of the game without having to move it. Again, re reducing the amount of clicks, thinking about my future self. And if you saw what I did there is I held D on the keyboard while moving that pivot point and I just kind of eyeballed it in the center of the handle. Now, if you want to have a very accurate pivot point, like say on the very end of an item, you could also turn on snap to points, which is the tiny little uh, magnet over here with a point next to it. Then when I hold D, I can actually snap onto the vertices of my object, right? So I'll show you that again from the side. It's going to hunt and peck for the nearest vertex and try to snap to it. Another one that I use commonly is snap to grid. And in that case, I would hold D and X, and then the pivot point will snap to a, a grid point. So often, um, where on, say, a character, I would have the character standing up if we imagine this is a character. I would want the pivot point on that character model to be aligned with 0, 0, 0. So I would hold X until, and then move it over until it snapped into place. This allows me to easily scale my character from the feet up without the feet going below the grid. That way when I drag objects into Unity, um, their feet would be on the floor for the case of a character. In the case of a weapon, you might want it to spawn or to be um, aligned horizontally, right? If uh, that's how it would kind of naturally exist in the game world. So pivot point being an option here to change. Again, I usually put mine in the center of the handle and then hold X by itself and move the object to zero, zero, zero. Then I'm going to go to modify and choose freeze transformations, which is going to zero out the translate values over here. This is also important for game engines. If you have a translate value, that means every time that you try to put the sword in a character's hand, it'll be like two feet above their hand, you know, or however far this translate value was inside the app. Next, since I have an unwrap and I um, have my file saved here on Maya side, I could go ahead and export. I'm going to do one last glance over here, and the thing that's bugging me is that some of these objects are uh, for the opposite side are horizontal. So instead, I'm just going to go to UV shell, transform, and then rotate some of these 90 degrees just so that they match their corresponding piece. Now, sometimes I would even put them together, but this piece is a little bit trickier, so it will uh, have to be moved. Okay. The other thing to consider for the UV map is if you have a particular small part of your object, say you have a common one that I recommend doing is like a jewel on the, the bottom of it, right? Like we've seen a few like this. Instead of leaving it all the same size across the object, if you have those small bits of detail, you would rather want to separate those into their own UV just noticed a little, little issue here where I'd done a demo and then not sewed those edges back up. Um, 
if you have one of those little detail areas, you would actually pick that shell and make that shell larger than the other pieces as far as the checkerboard is concerned. It, the checkerboard would look smaller in those detail areas, right? So say I wanted to get more of an intricate design or I have like a jewel or something that I want people to focus on, um, I would often make that area slightly larger relative to the other pieces. Now in this case, since I have two pieces for the top and the bottom, I would select them both at the same time and scale them together. That way they scale at the same rate. And then I would find room on the texture for all those pieces together. If they still aren't fitting, I might scale them all together rather than uh, one by one, because especially if you have matching pieces and you scale one differently to the other, right? the texture resolution is going to be different uh, for the same part. Let me go back a few steps here. Okay, so these two are vertical, these two, those, this one needs to just get flipped. And we can say that that's, that's ready to go. Now to export object mode, select your object. Again, I usually do a save right before this. I like the game exporter, choose the folder, give it a name and press tab or enter. Sometimes if, um, if you don't press tab, it won't update the actual file name. I think that's a bit of a bug. Okay. Also for the settings here, I just want to export the selection. I want to include smoothing groups. Now I do need to talk to you guys a little bit about smoothing groups, but Generally, you want to have mesh display soften edge. We'll just figure out the smoothing groups on its own. We deselect skinning and blend shapes, and then click export. Now over in substance, I go to file new, select, choose that FBX file. You can also do OBJ files. I'm going to check the document resolution. I could want to bump it up to 2K. The school machines can probably handle 4K. This is memory dependent, right? So 32 gigs probably of RAM, I would suggest for 4K. 16 gigs should be fine for 2K. Um, if you have a laptop and you only have eight gigs that you're working on, you w might want to scale back all the way down to 512, uh, but 1024 might be fine. So generally for the document resolution, I try to work in 2K or one step above what I'm going to be exporting as. All right, so I'm not using UV tile workflow. I don't want my cameras and I definitely do not want auto unwrap. Then I press OK. First thing I'm going to do is just rotate on my object a little bit so I can see it and I can check in this texture mode right that I had not done the uh, the mesh display smooth mesh so again this is the kind of thing that you notice only when you swap applications right is that you're looking at it in Maya and it's like oh it looks totally fine and then Either we bring it into the substance or Sketchfab or something similar, and we start to notice these problems with different renderers. So I'm not scared. I'm going to go back to Maya. I'm just going to go in this case to Mesh Display, Soften Edge, and it's going to fix those hard edges there, right, where it was now looking like a little poly sword. So Soften Edge, if you want to um, give it a little bit more sharpness though, especially along the blade area, this can be a good idea. I'm just going to shift select the sharp edge of the blade up to the point. 
actually you can use symmetry to get the other side. Possibly also this inside blade. So, and then sometimes where I have um, connecting materials, like say in this case I go from a softer gold to a harder steel, I might select that edge as well and use harden edge to accentuate that break point between the two material types and also to give a sharpness to the harder parts of the weapon, the hard parts of the blade. Okay, so now I've made some changes. I'll give it a new name, or I could overwrite the old one since it was bupkis, it's garbage. Go back and either start a new project, or if you want, what you could do is you could use the edit project configuration and just change this FBX here by pressing select, choosing it, and clicking OK. And here you can see the weapon is updated with the new model where I don't have that low poly um, cut. And I also have some nice sharp lines going down the edge of my blade and on the center for that uh, center split. So that hardened edge, um, controlling that is just another level of skill, right, that, that you can choose to master or choose to ignore. To, to your own detriment sometimes, right? But moving on, let's look at the Substance Painter process, if you haven't gone through that in a while. Again, the most important rule to be thinking about here are actually color rules. We don't necessarily want to get too carried away with, oh, this material looks so cool. I'm just going to have like seven of them, um, right? Like sometimes cool factor is only because we're seeing it for the first time. Um, and you might get lucky, like in this case, I got some cool effects here, but don't don't trust luck. Uh, rather, rather uh, apply textures more sparingly. So our first step here next to the Layers tab is Texture Set Settings. I want to scroll down here and choose Bake Mesh Maps. Again, we increase the resolution and the default settings are fine here. So we choose Bake Selected Textures. Here it fires photons around them and through the weapon to figure out things like the um, thickness, the curvature, right, compared to the things near it, the height. And the important one that it generates is the ambient occlusion, which is just going to add some dark shadows in areas that are uh, kind of like the nooks and crannies. And if you uh, look at the, say, corners or ceilings of your house, you can actually notice that ambient occlusion in the real world where light is struggling to penetrate all the way to the corner there. So it is getting bounced out before it reaches all the way into a sharp corner. And it just kind of accentuates the 3D-ness uh, of a model, right? Kind of accentuates some of the curves and, and breakpoints. The other thing that that does is it helps the smart materials. Over here, we have the second set of materials is the smart materials. It helps these guys uh, combine multiple different textures and materials together to produce some interesting effects. So, for instance, it might produce rust along the hardest edges on the object. Or the one I like to demonstrate this on is the denim jeans smart texture. Because what it does is it actually applies stitches oh, it should actually apply the texture. <laughs> uh, something that I missed here. 
Uh, so this smart material here, the denim one, should apply the denim texture and also the stitches. But oh, I'm here. I am looking at the wrong um, material type. So this drop down here, right? I changed to ambient occlusion. I just need to change this back to my material using lighting. So here's the denim material, and you can see that the details are actually using the edges of my model um, to choose where to put the stitches, to choose where to put the flat parts, right, and maybe even where to put some curvature. So here I have a texture seam along the side. I have a texture seam, right? And th because this is a smart material generated using Substance Designer, right? We're using Substance Painter. Um, whoever made this material programmed that in using uh, a node network, right? To tell it when you encounter an edge of this thickness and this direction change. Uh, apply this other texture. So you might also see it in some of your steel textures, especially the painted steels, where it will actually be able to catch the edge and show where in those areas. So smart materials, really one of the most excellent things that, that's happened in the world of 3D modeling in, in the last decade. Now our job here though is to be more faithful to our concept art than we are to our own sense of maybe what's cool. So especially for other people who used uh, AI art for your generation, um, please do go back and, and inspect your concept art to look for inspiration there. Now for mine, I'm breaking down my materials into this silvery steel, right? So I can go look for, I have a few different steel types that I'll, I'll choose one for the blade. And again, I'll kind of go through a few of these. Maybe I, I'll drag a few of them onto my layers just so I can swap between them quickly. But you can also uh, sometimes layer them together and actually use Photoshop filters to get different effects from combining multiple textures, right? So you sometimes want to actually think like a Photoshop 2D artist in terms of uh, what benefits can I pull from the layer uh, below it. So in this case, I got a bit lucky. I will move on to uh, my next color so in order to start adding colors more selectively, I'm now going to add a black mask. In this case, I've got two that I'm juggling, so I'll add them to both. I go to the fourth tool down here, Polygon Fill, and either using UV Chunk or Polygon Fill, now I select faces that are going to have um, a particular texture, or if I'm in chunk fill, it will fill um, any of these UV islands completely. And what that's doing is filling in that mask with uh, white pixels there to tell it to display that layer. So if I do that on both these, give it a second to refresh, now I can see those masks have been uh, changed. Now, if I have one where I want to layer and don't want to go th through selecting again, I can uh, actually copy the layer mask. Control Alt C and I can paste it into another layer. So I have a few different gold textures here that I'm going to try out. Gold armor, gold damaged. Again, when in doubt, flip back to your concept dart to see which one is closer, and then maybe consider combining them to 
get the desired effect. Also inspect these closely to look for texture stretching and things on the uh, normal maps or bump maps. All right, so those are my first two colors. My last color is a kind of a deep sapphire color or deep blue. So I have been using the sapphire uh, rock color, right? It's important to use a variety of different materials here. I don't want to necessarily just pick one for the color itself or because it looks pretty on the uh, preview, right? I actually want to use the materials that would be used in the real world. So the reason for that being that they will give the surface different reflective properties in the render engine that makes them feel more real. Right, so I've got a couple of nice ones that might not be part of the default set. Remember, you can go, uh, if you search for Substance Share, uh, it's, there's a website that has uh, community-made substance textures for free. Now, those are installed in a uh, special folder that you can view by right-clicking any material. Choose Show in, Show in Explorer. And here you can see the file path, program files, Adobe, Adobe Substance Painter, resources, starter assets, smart material, metal. All right, so usually I'm just going to dump them into uh, the corresponding folder here. Metal, organic, plastic, stone. Uh, I don't really use the folder structure particularly. You could then drag and drop these here into the workspace area and it will import them or you can use file import resources. So I can still think about experimenting with um, you know some some different materials that might not fit the real world one but for my uh, my preference is to just go ahead and use something like the stone that could actually be used by, say, a master craftsman. Now I can also choose to possibly brush in this material rather than simply um, masking out polygons, right? So this is where having the drawing tablet will really uh, elevate your game in that you can really go in and create some interesting um, designs that flow across the object that it's a little bit harder to accomplish and is more mechanical in um, in 3d terms like if I going in here I can still do a nice job of like breaking up some colors maybe or again I'm thinking in terms of like how would this actually be put together right in the real world if somebody had uh, a really nice piece of stone and they wanted to uh, make a sword, right? Like, how would they approach that? Got some, some lag there. Oh, and I left a nasty triangle cut there from my experiments. Um, that bothers me, so <laughs> I'm going to go back that triangle. So on the flip side. So I did end up having two versions and I just imported the wrong one. So again, if I make any changes in Maya, I just go to edit, 
project configuration inside of Substance. And I select um, my new file. It will save my textures and also try to what it calls preserve brush strokes, uh, which is wherever the texture has been laid down. Although I can see that it didn't manage to save my um, my stone placement there, so I'll have to redo that. That's a bug. Okay. All right. So now I want to again try to think about that the three color rule, which is to have a balance of about um, 30, 60, and 10 in terms of percentages. Uh, I can actually keep a better eye on that sometimes in the UVs, but I want to at least have um, two main colors and then one complementary color. In this case, blue and orange, or blue and yellow, are often uh, complementary colors. If um, you're painting like I was and you make a mistake, you can quickly swap to erasing by tapping X, which changes the gradient value from zero to one, or one to zero, and you can just swap between additive and subtractive uh, polygon fill mode. the symmetry button. I was wondering where that was. Looks like I accidentally selected a few on the back side here, so let me just fix these. Let's see what kind of symmetry we can get. Mirror X, mirror Y. Okay, so I would want to mirror Y primarily. Show intersection, which is the red. Okay, we don't necessarily want to show that. Oh, hide while painting, okay. up, but I want to take a look at where, even though this one has a lot of detail on the surface, I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to go into this much detail, um, I do want to start to spot where kind of the gold is more accentuated versus where the, bl the blue is, so it looks like I missed uh, an opportunity over here. And then if I want things to flow over an edge, right, this is again where I would actually want to have my, my whack amount. I can choose to paint in 3D, but sometimes it's actually easier to paint on the UV maps here if you have a good setup. Right, it's a much shorter brush stroke with less camera rotation. So try swapping back and forth between sort of laying down polygons in, in the 3D viewport, but also kind of turning your eye to the 2D side 
um, to soften out some of those lines and maybe like hide some of the geometry, right? We don't necessarily want people to be able to tell that it's has cuts and that it has seams, right? On, on a 3D object, the goal is always to hide the 3D object underneath so that the person is immersed and they believe what they're seeing is real. Yeah. So I'll do some experimentation here. I mean, I'm going to spend a few hours on this texture, so I'll, I might have to do another video to catch that. Um, but if you've got a decent result, you want to then try exporting your, um, your textures and trying this out or taking a look at what it looks like at the next stage, which is uploaded online and in a uh, web-friendly viewer, which is the uh, Sketchfab object viewer that we're going to be using. So I know that this, uh, this means that we have yet another technical hurdle and I do appreciate that this stuff is is hard for a lot of people so guys like please use the help wanted channels and the tutorials and Google right every tool at your disposal to make your way past some of these technical hurdles because if this stuff was easy everybody would do it right it's not easy and it's not something that you can just necessarily pick up in an afternoon um, Rob and I are just used to this stuff because we we use it every you know every year for every, every time that we teach these classes so um, a lot of the methods that we use we might be breezing through and make it look, look a bit easier than it really is. So please, like, don't feel like you can't slow us down sometimes, right? Remind us or just tell us that you have a question or that uh, you have a problem, and we will do our best to help help you solve those. Um, not really happy with these bits at the end here, so I'll just change that, and then I will. still get creative with my design in terms of like changing the, um, the concept art details but uh, this is just going to be a, a practice run drawing with a mouse, which I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> if I was going to be doing my, my real texture, I would uh, take the extra step of getting out the, the tablet and, um, and making these brush strokes look a lot nicer. Oops. So here I'm tapping B, change to go back to the material. What I was looking for is control and right click to change the size of the brush. now. Also the challenges of working in symmetry mode, right, or not having symmetry suddenly uh, can, be, can be a bit frustrating. Oh, how do I 
master it down there. So this is another reason why um, I wanted to have these two pieces matching so that if I run into this kind of issue where I've messed up one side of the object, I could always go to the other side and copy and paste that part over uh, just from Photoshop. And again, this is just a very rough job just so that we've got something to export. So save my substance project. I'm also working on a um, a witch character for uh, the second years. I guess uh, playing a lot of Harry Potter, so I wanted to make a, a female character as well. I've only been making uh, male characters for the last year, so. the other project in that folder. Um, otherwise, this is pretty much good to go. I'm happy with this. One other thing I can check is holding shift and right click will change the lighting on the object. And it's sometimes good to bake in a little bit of lighting um, to catch some of those, those areas that are a little more subtle. So on mine, I still want to come on, uh, come and do some work on this blade and have an inlay like on my concept art. So again, I, I'm only just laying down the foundation for this texture. This is by no means a complete texture. But to export it, I go to File, Export Textures. Here is where it's gonna be saved. So often you want to either export into the same sort of folder name or even better to just make a new folder out on your desktop or a folder that you're already working in that you're, you're able to find quickly uh, and also not being married to your first version right like to give it a version number right away at the end of that folder because all of your texture files are going to uh, land here depending on which output template you use is that's what's going to change the actual texture files that are exported. So usually we're over here in the Uni uh, Unity HD render pipeline or the universal render pipeline if you're working on mobile games. Here you can see they also have Unreal 4 support, uh, Dota, CryEngine, Blender, and Arnold within Maya. So one thing that you could possibly do to test your materials is to export to Arnold uh, and then back in Maya to create an Arnold material, which if we search inside of the Hypershade for AI standard, we can use the AI standard surface option to get a good um, base texture for an Arnold render. So, I've forgotten which one can work for Jeep. This one is the old one. That's our concept. So, what I would then do is assign this standard material to my sword. and then hook up the material slot by selecting the AI standard surface. And looking here, I see it has color, roughness, metalness, uh, specular roughness, and there are some other things hidden down here like emission being the glow
then I would actually just with those Substance Painter textures that I'm going to export, say if I would go back to settings and choose export. Click on open output directory so that I can take a look at them. And here I can see the blades, the handle, the base of the weapon. This is the height map. Don't usually use the height map. Um, you are able to hook it up in various engines. Metallic map, mixed AO. It, AO is ambient occlusion. Normal map, direct X normal map. So the regular normal map is OpenGL settings. The direct X one uh, slightly different. It's just going to change one of the X Y values uh, from positive to negative. It's going to be in Unreal Engine. Uh, roughness right there. Right. So now what I can do is bring all these textures into Maya. Now, typically I wouldn't do this step. This is just for uh, those of you who want to, to try this out or who would rather uh, test things in the renderer that, um, that you have access to without uploading it to the website. Alrighty, so now I can hook up these, um, like the base color PNG height map. Again, I said I wasn't really going to use the height map, metallic map. Out color to littleness. Sometimes I have to set these inside the folder picker rather because they're going to add another um, node in between here. I'm not so so great at using the node network. So if you're into that stuff, great, definitely worth playing around with. Um, I have not spent the time yet, so. This folder. Choose the metallic. Click back onto the main texture in order to get this uh, selection menu back. Now, usually roughness is the metallic roughness, so I'm just going to check here that that's what it's meant for. do I have here? Height map and the normal map is the important one. Click back on AI its surface. And I'm assuming that it's in here. Sorry, I haven't checked this te texture for a while. Here's where I can change it to a normal map and I'm going to choose bump value, image name. And my normal map. Then in the viewport, I can press six. It's going to be very, very dark until I create an Arnold light. Now, it's best to do it through the Arnold menu to see the different options here. Uh, the Sky Dome light or the physical sky are the two um, that you can get the best or fastest results with, so I'll just choose here. And then if I click on the little light bulb in the viewport, uh, it does brighten it up maybe a little bit too much. Oops. So it's a render, click on the film clapper, it's set to Arnold Renderer, and because I have an Arnold surface, it should be interacting correctly. It looks like my metallic is maybe not showing correctly. You can 
it does display. Um, yeah, it might just be my uh, my ignorance of, of the updates in Arnold. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, usually, like I said, we'd rather be outputting to Unity. Another one that is a more kind of catch-all for compatibility is PBR, Metallic Roughness. Here in this menu, you can see the different textures that are being uh, exported. And you can also see if they are being exported as a grayscale, an RGB, right, or an RGB with a grayscale as an alpha. Now it gets a little bit more intense once you start customizing these, right? You can actually make your own, uh, but that's a little bit higher level than, than we need to be worrying about. So from this point, um, I'm going to switch you over to Rob's video on uploading to Sketchfab, um, and that's where uh, the next round of testing should go. So save your files, guys. Make sure that you keep backups, and uh, do try and enjoy your time within Substance Painter. Like you've put in all the work of like creating this design, modeling it out, keeping your your surface nice and clean. Um, give it that extra bit of love at the end, right? Like paint something interesting on it, give it a cool theme, uh, make it dark and brooding or fantastical and wonderful, you know, whatever, whatever strokes your fancy, uh, chase those, those ideas at this point, right? Because this is where kind of the creative doors get thrown open and a lot of that, uh, technical, slow down right it ceases to to exist it's it's a lot quicker once you get to this stage and maybe some of you will decide to live here in the space and become texture artists in the future right others might prefer the uh the more technical rules of of maya right um but there are specialist jobs for both uh and very high demand uh for for jobs that are a pain in the butt, like UV unwrapping. So keep that in mind, right? For the more difficult things, uh, you're going to get paid more. So uh, best of luck, guys. Please um, send me an FBX file if you want me to check something or some screenshots of any problems that you're running into. I'll try and stay active on, on Discord, uh, despite the, the strikes, meaning uh, no classes uh, over the next period. So. I'll see you guys uh, hopefully soon.